All right, have your Bibles. You ready to go? Matthew 5. Uh, we're continuing our series that we are calling Citizens. It's based on that section of the, the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus known as the Beatitudes. Uh, you see that there in verses 3 through 12. Today we are going to focus in on verse 7. All right, so we're slowly every week taking another Beatitude. We are almost to the end. We're down to verse 7 where Jesus talks about the merciful. Again, yeah, keep your hands up. If you'd like a Bible, raise your hand. Sorry, I should have said that. Raise your hand up. We want you to see the scriptures. Not all the scriptures will be on the screen. So if you would like a Bible in your hands, raise your hand up, ushers will bring that to you. That's our gift to you. If you don't own a Bible, that is our gift to you. If you do own a Bible, just leave it there and then someone else will be able to use it again. You can leave it in your seat as you leave. Thank you team for filling in for my mistake there. <laughs> um, so we are in verse seven where Jesus talks about the merciful. So we're focusing in on the merciful today. The merciful who's, is who Jesus is talking about today. Notice Matthew five, verse seven. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Again, blessed there is referring to those who have um, received God's grace in Christ. It's not, you know, they're lucky enough to have been brought into the kingdom. They're not, you know, didn't just stumble into the kingdom. They've experienced God's grace in Christ. And because of that, they are blessed. They are blessed by God. It says, blessed are the merciful. We're going to talk about what that means. What is it? What does mercy mean according to the Bible? When Jesus uses the word mercy or he talks about people being merciful, what is he talking about, right? So blessed are these people, the merciful. Why? For they will be shown mercy. It could be translated for they alone will receive or be shown mercy. Mercy. Now, here's what you need to understand. That is, generally speaking, a truism, right? Generally speaking, people who are merciful in life, if you're merciful to people, people will tend to be more merciful to you. Is that right? Okay, so that's, generally speaking, a truism. It's like the Proverbs, okay? It's not a promise necessarily if we just take it on the surface, because you could be merciful to somebody and, and not receive mercy. But generally speaking, that is a truism, but that's not what Jesus is getting at here. It's also not karma. Okay. Cause so some are like, that's right. You know, if, if you're not merciful in this life, watch out payback, right? Next life it's coming at you. That that's not what it's saying. That's not what Jesus is teaching. Just so you know, karma is not in the Bible. We need to clarify that. We, we do live in California, all right? So let's clarify that. <laughs> Karma is not in the Bible. The idea of consequences for actions, that is in the Bible. But there, the Bible is clear. Jesus is clear. There is only one life, right? You live and then you die and then you stand before God, okay? We don't have this repeating cycles of life. You live once, you die, you stand before God, then you have eternity with God or without God, okay? So that's, that's the teaching of the Bible. That's what Jesus believes. That's what Jesus would teach. So Jesus is not teaching karma here, payback, that kind of idea. No, that is not what he's saying. The idea here is, this is a futuristic. This is a, fu notice the tense. It's a future tense. For they will in the future be shown mercy. What Jesus is saying is, people who show mercy based on how the, what the Bible means by mercy, what Jesus means by mercy, will be people who in the end, when they stand before God, receive God's mercy. They will experience God's mercy for all eternity, okay? That, that is what Jesus is saying. So blessed are the merciful. Why are the merciful blessed? Because these are the people that are gonna experience God's mercy for eternity. 
They're under God's mercy now, they're under God's grace now, and they will be for all eternity. Now, before you jump to, oh, so if I'm merciful, I earn God's favor, or if I'm merciful, then God owes me mercy, no, okay? And I'll explain that more as we go. So bless other merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, remember, okay, so some some reminders from the series. These beatitudes are not requirements that need to be met before you can enter into Jesus' kingdom. He's talking about the citizens of the kingdom, talking about what they're gonna look like. But remember, these are not requirements. If they were, if that was the case, they are actually requirements, nobody would ever be a citizen of the kingdom. Because nobody is going to be perfectly merciful the way Jesus is talking about in this life. We will never measure up perfectly to God's standard of what it means to be merciful. We're going to see that today. The scripture is clear. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Romans 3, 23. Even in the area of mercy, and you might be like, I'm a pretty merciful person. And you might be in comparison to the rest, you know, other human beings, but nowhere near to compare to God. And so that's what Paul's talking about. We all fall short of God's standard, not human standard, okay? So you can be super merciful in other, pe- other people's eyes, but on your own, apart from God's grace, we don't even come close to God's mercy. So therefore, Paul says, we fall short of that and we need his grace. He goes on to say, Ephesians 2, 8 and, and 9, uh, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, grace, Okay, not perfection, not obedience, not being merciful. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. You don't earn this. You don't do this. You don't deserve this. It's a gift of God. It's not by works, he says, so that nobody can boast or brag. Arrogant Christian is an oxymoron, all right? So if you're in the room and going, oh, I'm good today. Talking about merciful? I gave 25 cents to somebody the other day in need. I and merciful, okay, you're not, all right? So that nobody can boast, all right? Okay, so they're not requirements, so then what are they? They're what we've been calling marks or or evidences of those who have experienced the grace of God through Jesus, okay? They're marks, not means. They're evidence, they're marks. They're not the way in to a relationship with God. They're the evidence or the marks that you have a relationship with God, okay? They they, they represent the general disposition of those who have turned to Jesus for grace and forgiveness and then because of that have the Holy Spirit indwelling them who is progressively transforming them more and more into the image of Jesus. Did you know that's kind of the primary work of the Holy Spirit right now inside of you, indwelling you as a believer? It's changing us from the inside out so that our lives look more and more like the life of Christ. That's why Kent Hughes says this about the beatitude for today. Notice what he says, you'll see the quote on the screen. What this beatitude means is that those who are truly God's children, not just religious people, not just people who attend church, but those who are truly God's children and as such are objects of his mercy, okay? If you don't want God's mercy, you are not a child of God. The only way you become a child of God, right? A citizen of the kingdom is that you know you need mercy. They will themselves be merciful and will receive mercy in the end. So showing mercy is evidence that we have received mercy. Woo, okay. Let me read that last sentence. Again, showing mercy is evidence that we have received mercy, okay? Now, here's where we're gonna go for the rest of our time. We're gonna look at the definition of mercy, We're gonna look at the extent of mercy and then we're gonna look at the motivation for mercy, okay? Definition, extent, motivation. Here we go. 
Definition of mercy. This is actually really, really important, wouldn't you say? If what Jesus says is true, only the merciful will be shown mercy, it seems like we should understand what Jesus meant by describing his followers as merciful. So let me give you a biblical definition of what mercy is. It's two parts, okay? It's a two-part definition. Biblical mercy is both compassion, but not just compassion, not just a feeling, compassion in action and forgiveness for those who have wronged you, okay? So the merciful Jesus is talking about, those who are gonna receive mercy, who have experienced God's mercy, uh, are people who more and more are exemplifying these characteristics in their life. Compassion in action, and forgiveness for those who have wronged you. That's what Jesus means by someone who is merciful, right? Now, a couple verses to help you see what that looks like. 1 John 3, notice on the screen. If anyone has material possessions, now notice this isn't saying that if you don't have anything, you need to like be generous if you don't have anything. It's just saying, if you have more than you need, right? If you have some stuff, if you have some abundance, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, all right? So you see a need, you need somebody, you see somebody hurting, you have, you see somebody who needs something, whatever it is, but has no pity on them. How can the love of God be in that person? pretty logical, right? Like God loved us in our mess and we experience his grace and mercy if we're in Christ, then you would think that would flow out of us, right? If we have the love of God in us, that's going to flow out of us. So notice what he says, dear children, right? So he's speaking to believers, to the church. Let us not love with words or speech, but look at this, but with actions and in truth, okay? So don't just say loving things, do loving things. Don't just say loving things, do loving things, but notice what it says. But with actions and in truth. Listen, here's the deal. True belief, right belief, right doctrine is gonna lead to right action. That's why he says, but in actions, in truth. In other words, it's rooted. Your actions of mercy, your actions of love, your actions of compassion are rooted in the truth. See, a lot of times in churches, it's either truth or it's merciful action. It's compassion and action. And that's not in the Bible. We've created that. The reality is the more you believe the truth of the gospel, the more loving we're going to be in our actions, okay? And it's not going to just be words, it's going to be action, okay? Another one, Colossians 3.13, bear with each other. In other words, don't cancel people, okay? (laughs) Don't write them off because they're different than you or they might have hurt you or offended you or whatever. So bear with one another and forgive one another. Forgive one another. Remember, that's what mercy is. Forgiving those who have hurt you, okay? Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, now look at this. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Why do we forgive? Because God forgave us. We're going to spend some more time on that in just a little bit. Okay, so if that's what biblical mercy is, compassion in action and forgiveness for those who have wronged you, some logical questions follow. How far do we go with that? Right? How far do I have to be compassionate? How far do I have to forgive? Uh, When is enough enough? See, this is where I jump right away. You tell me to forgive and I'm like, well, how often do I have to forgive? 
<laughs> How many times? Uh, what kind of offense can I not forget? If it's really bad, do I still have to forgive? Those are the questions. Unfortunately, I'm letting you in on me. And uh, I'm a human being and I'm not perfect yet. And so I struggle with this stuff. And I told our worship team before, as I talked a little bit about what we're talking about today, I had to do a lot of repenting this week and I had to do a lot of looking myself in the mirror and remind myself I got a long way to go. Okay. So, so we start asking these kind of questions like, how far is enough? How far, you know, what's enough? Do I have to express compassion to everyone? Even those people I don't like? <laughs> or, or who don't like me? Well, God, they don't like me. Why do I have to like them? That's natural, right? The, it, we we kind of feel that. Uh, how many times do I have to forgive someone? Okay, if I do forgive them, how many times do I have to forgive them? What if they've done something incredibly evil to me? Do I have to forgive? Okay, so th those and many other questions lead us to this next point. Let's look at the extent of mercy. All right, so we, we see the definition of mercy, compassion in action, and forgiving those who have wronged us. Now, let's talk about well, how far does that go? What's the extent of that? What's the extent of compassion in action? What's the extent of forgiveness for those who have wronged us, all right? So let's talk first about compassion in action. You can turn to Luke chapter 10 if you'd like to. We're gonna see Jesus actually talking about this. Luke chapter 10, so if you're in Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, couple books to the right, Luke chapter 10. I just sound that like Darth Vader there. <laughs> Luke, I am your father, right? Okay, go to Luke 10. I'm a Star Wars kid, sorry. Luke 10, you'll be there. Now, before we read it, here's a question for us. If we're talking about compassion in Ashkenaz, what good is a compassionate or merciful feeling if there's no action attached to it? Okay. Now, I don't want to downplay proper feelings. We should feel, we should like, it, okay, can I, can, I'm good. I'm going to, I'm going to risk it here. When you drive down main street and you see people camping out in the parks and on the sidewalks, you should feel something and it shouldn't be self-righteousness and it, your first thought shouldn't be, well, they did that to themselves. Why is that? One, you don't know if they did that to themselves or not. Some did, some choose to live that way. I totally know that, I'm not denying that. But I think our self-righteous attitude reveals something in us. If our first reaction is, when you see someone down and out and in need, a homeless person on the street or whatever, and our first, and our first response is, what dumb decisions did they make to get there? reveals some self-righteousness in us in a prideful attitude. It's, again, it's not that maybe there were dumb decisions that led them there, but who are we to like look down on people because they made bad decisions? Let me ask you, have you ever made a bad decision? You're in here and you look great and it looks like you like tried to dress yourself well today and <laughs> it smells like everybody took a shower and that's wonderful. But so what that means is it's just that your bad decisions didn't lead to that. Okay. So what good is a compassionate or merciful feeling if there is no action attached to it? I am all for feeling the right way. But the Bible is also all for acting the right way. So. Listen to James. And let's remember, again, this is not on the screen. It's going to be James chapter 2, if you want to write the reference down. James 2, 14 through 17. Remember, James is Jesus' brother. All right? He was his half-brother, technically, because Joseph was his father, where Joseph wasn't Jesus' father. But listen to what James says. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? I'm a Christian, but your life doesn't reflect that. That's what he's saying. What good is that? 
Can such a faith save them? Can the kind of faith that you profess that doesn't change your life and doesn't affect how you live, is that really saving faith? No, that's what he's saying. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, right? Be warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So James is saying, if you profess that you're a Christian, but there's zero action flowing out of a regenerated heart that would show that, he's saying you really aren't a Christian. You don't really have saving faith because what saving faith does makes you merciful. It it makes you compassionate. It makes you willing to forgive. So being someone who is merciful is much more than having a merciful feeling. Okay. So again, into our brains, if, if you're sitting here going, okay, I'm good. Cause one time, five years ago, I felt compassion for somebody. We got some work to do. Okay. It goes way beyond just that feeling. It's a feeling that yes, that compassion, it is a feeling, but it's a feeling that moves us and leads us to action. To express compassion in action is the kind of person Jesus is talking about when he refers to the merciful. So he's, when he says the merciful will be shown mercy, this is the kind of person he's talking about. The kind of person who doesn't just have feelings, that feeling leads to action, okay? Okay. But again, here's our questions. To what extent? How far does that go? What's it going to cost me? How many will be honest? You don't have to raise your hand. I will raise my hand though. One of the things that keeps me from being compassion is how much it's going to cost me. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about my schedule. Maybe even socially, what that will cost me socially, what people might think about me. All right, so Jesus gets into all of that. Look at Luke chapter 10. Now, before we start uh, reading in verse 30, I want to give you the context. Look back at verse 25. Luke 10, 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to Jesus So there's this idea, there's going to be a confrontation, the expert in the law, the law there is just referring to the Old Testament. So this is an expert in the Old Testament, an expert, a Jewish expert in the Old Testament, basically the Bible of the day, because they didn't have the New Testament, right? So he's an expert in the Bible. He says, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a very religious question, right? Religion basically says you have to do stuff to get God's favor. You have to do to get, to earn eternal life, to earn relationship with God, to earn you know, heaven. You have to do certain things. That's what religion teaches. Christianity is the opposite, but this guy obviously is a religious guy. Look at what Jesus says. This is amazing. He goes, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Well, he answered, he, and his answer, by the way, would be the exact same answer Jesus get, would give. Jesus actually gives this answer when somebody said, hey, what's the whole teaching of the law? Jesus gives the exact same answer. So he's going to be right. Look what he says. Here's the whole thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. And the other one is equal to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice what Jesus says. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Jesus is saying, if you could actually do that, then yes, you will be in heaven someday. Absolutely. If you could love God with all that you are, do that perfectly for your whole life and love your neighbor as much as you love yourself and do that perfectly for your whole life, then you better believe you are going to be in the kingdom of God someday. But what do we know about that? Nobody does that. 
And that's exactly what Jesus is getting at. He's trying to show him, hey, absolutely, you do that and you're in. But the point is, nobody does that except for Jesus. Jesus is the only one who does that. Okay, keep going. But he wanted to justify himself. In other words, he wanted to know who he actually had to love this way. Look what he says. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That's, that's a question to clarify. He wants to be able to exclude certain people. That's the idea. He's like, okay, I'll love my neighbor, but, but who really is my neighbor? A better question would have been, like the right question would have been, well, then how can I be a loving neighbor? But that's not what he asked. He's basically saying, then who do I not have to love? Who's my neighbor and who's not? And Jesus is like, oh, okay, let's keep going. Now, this is our passage for the day. Look what it says. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers, all right? This was known in the ancient world to be a dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. This happened all the time. So the original audience hearing this, right? The lawyer, the, the expert in the law, hearing this is like, well, yeah, I read that in the paper yesterday, okay? Like this was typical everyday stuff, right? But look what he says. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Not all the way dead, but mostly dead, okay? follow along. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we'll unpack that later. Uh, 31, a priest happened to be going down the same road. So you got a priest, you got this guy who was robbed and beaten and stripped and left for dead. He wasn't dead. He was half dead. And now you got some people who are going to start walking by. You see a priest, right? Remember, he's talking to a religious guy. He's talking to a guy who was, a, who was an expert in the Old Testament. So you mention a priest and he's like, well, for sure, the priest is going to do the right thing. And, and what's it say? And a priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Dude looks like he needs help. Okay. Walk this way, right? How many, <laughs> this is getting a little close to home, isn't it? How many times do we do that? Someone in need. Ooh, I hope somebody can help him. All right. Keep going. So to a Levite, another religious, Jewish religious leader, a, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan. So here's your three characters. You got the priest, you got the Levite. You, the assumption is that they would do something. They don't. And then who's the hero of the story? A Samaritan, the arch enemy of Israel, the people that the Jews looked down on and despised for all kinds of reasons. They despised the Samaritans so much that if, if they were traveling somewhere and the most direct route to get to where they were going was through Samaria, they would actually walk around Samaria. They would take the longest route possible just so that they don't step foot in Samaria, touch Samarian soil so that they aren't violated and made unclean. That was how they viewed the Samaritans. But this guy's gonna be the hero, okay? Look what he says. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, all the other ones saw him, but they just kept moving. Doesn't even say that they felt anything for him. But look at this. When he saw him, he what? Took pity on him. He was affected at a heart level. There was a feeling, there was compassion in his heart. And it's compassion in action. It's not just a feeling. Keep going. He went to him and bandaged his wounds and pouring, in oil, uh, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. Like he's going to, you know, walk so that this other guy could ride. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. Went to a hotel, gave the guy the bed and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. That's like two days wages, two days wages. 
and gave them to the innkeeper looking after him. He said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any, look at that, any extra expense you have. Which of these, Jesus now asked the question, here's where it drops. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Well, the expert in the law replied, the one who had what? Mercy on him. You see, the way he acted towards this, the way the Samaritan acted to this man is what mercy is. It's compassion in action. Jesus told him, now go and do likewise. This is what it looks like to be my followers. So what's it gonna cost? Well, breaking social barriers and being willing to be looked down on by others, giving up some daily needs that you might have like oil and wine, that's what he gave up. But the, the fact that he had bandages, probably what happened there was he probably ripped his own clothes so that he could create bandages. You don't just carry around bandages unless you're like a helicopter mom. <laughs> and you got your little fanny pack so that when Johnny scrapes his knee, Right, but most of us aren't doing that, right? Like so, so this is not not a soccer mom. So he's, well, I don't have anything else. So what am I going to do? Rip, you know? And I love you, soccer moms. Um, time and schedule. What's it cost him? He whatever he was doing, he was going somewhere. He he was busy. He stopped and said, I'm going to get you to this inn. I'm going to get you taken care of. I'm going to stay there overnight to make sure you're doing okay. Totally adjusted his schedule, ate up his day, ate up the, some of the next day, was going to come back, right? Schedule totally messed up. And then actually, yeah, literally it cost him money. Two days wages. That's a lot of money. And he was willing to pay more if he needed to. For somebody he didn't know, for somebody that most, like, for, 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 and again, think about it. Here's a Samaritan doing this for somebody who probably at some point had made all kinds of racial slurs about his people. Wow. Amazing. That's what it means to be merciful. A person whose heart is moved with compassion for those who are suffering and in need. What's need mean? It could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be spiritual, and then their compassion doesn't just end with a feeling, it moves them to action like Jesus. Thank God Jesus didn't just feel things about us. Thankfully, that feeling he had for us, love, motivated him to be merciful towards us. Again, not on the screen, just listen. Matthew 9, 36, when he, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. They, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus speaking, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often I have longed, I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What a beautiful picture. And that's God saying, that's what I want to do. And you were not willing. So what did Jesus' compassion cause him to do? He felt that way, but what did he do with that feeling? Just stand back and say, well, hey, everybody, I love you. Go in peace, right? Do the religious thing. Go in peace. Tell people it was their fault that they were in that situation? No. Jesus loved people. He was moved with compassion, so he was what? Merciful. He taught them God's truths, absolutely. He taught them the truth. He literally fed them. We know that. He healed them. And then ultimately, the most merciful thing he did, the most obvious example of compassion in action was he died on the cross 
for them. He stretched out his arms, laid down his life for them. Jesus' mercy for us was an incredibly costly mercy. It wasn't cheap mercy. It was costly mercy. And that's the kind of mercy Jesus is saying his followers will be marked by, this kind of compassion in action. But the mercy Jesus is talking about isn't just compassion, it's also forgiveness. Write this down. It's forgiveness. It's forgiving those who have wronged you. Now listen, I know this is not a characteristic that's really in favor today in our culture. Our culture is all about justice, but is clueless about the God of justice. But man, we are all about justice. One of the most, you know, um, loved and popular movie franchises of the last number of years is John Wick. Like, what's that all about? These Russian gangsters bust into his house, right? Kill his dog, beat him up, steal his car that he loves, and then he spends the next four movies wiping everybody out. And I gotta tell you, it's pretty awesome, but like, here's the deal. <laughs> it's actually beautifully shot and artistically great, but here's the reality. Here's how sinful I am. I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah, 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 get him. Kill my dog? It's on, right? Like, you can take my car, but you mess with my dog and it's done. And that's the natural person in me. And that's why we resonate so much with it. Here's why, because we're not yet perfect. We're not yet conformed perfectly to the image of Jesus. And so that sinful flesh in us is like, yeah, get him, John Wick. Get him, right? But we got to remind ourselves, that's a movie. <laughs> that's not the way of Jesus. And honestly, that's not justice, that's revenge. Huge difference. So much talk today in our culture about justice is actually revenge. Big difference, big difference. The focus is on wrongs being made right, perpetrators or abusers receiving consequences for their actions, those who have abused power being called to account for that. And listen, that's actually a good thing because God is all for justice. It's one of his attributes. Listen, the Bible says God is just. That's who he is. That's his character and his nature. He is just. He is the very definition of what justice is. But listen, not at the expense of forgiveness. They are not mutually exclusive. Whereas in our culture, you're either just or you're forgiving. And if you're forgiving, you're not doing justice. That's how the culture sees it. Justice and forgiveness can coincide. They do in God. And if they don't in our own hearts, we will ultimately turn into the oppressors and abusers, just like the ones who hurt and wronged us. And we will ultimately turn into what we despise in others if we don't forgive. Okay? And that's why Jesus commands his followers to forgive and keep forgiving. Okay? Matthew 18, if you would. Turn back to Matthew. Matthew 18. And I want to show you again, Jesus talking about this and showing us the extent of this. Well, okay, how far? How far? How far do we got to go? Uh, <laughs> and Peter, as usual, is our example. <laughs> Look what he says. And Peter reveals our attitude. All right, so before we too quickly, you know, Look down on Peter, be honest, that's us, okay? So notice what he says. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? How many times, what's the extent do I have to forgive somebody if they sin against me? Okay, notice what he says, up to seven times? Now here's why that's such a big deal. He thinks that's awesome. Because what was taught in Judaism of the day was you are expected to forgive up to three times. So what does he do? He doubles it and adds one. He's like, say, Jesus, I'm doing right, right? I'm doing good, look at me, I'm awesome. And Jesus is like, oh boy, here we go again, Peter. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but look at this, 
but 77 times. Seven is an important word in the Bible, by the way. Anytime it's, re- it's in connection to God, it's talking about, it's in a sense kind of God's number, and it's a number of completeness or infinity. So when he says 77 times, what he's saying is you just keep forgiving. You, you forgive and you just keep forgiving, okay? And then he says, 23, therefore, I'm gonna tell a parable, the kingdom of heaven. Remember, that's what this whole thing's about. We're talking about citizens of the kingdom. Jesus in Matthew 4, 23 said, hey, the kingdom's here. This is what it looks like. Y'all, this is what it looks like. The kingdom of heaven right now is visible through our forgiveness. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, which by the way, kings have every right to do. Keep going. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, right? You can't even calculate how much that is. That's the idea. It's an unpayable debt. He was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt, which wouldn't even actually repay it all. Even if they were sold into slavery, there's no way that'd be enough. But the the king's like, I gotta get something out of this, right? At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything, which couldn't have been done, by the way. 27, the servant's master took pity on him. He felt something, right? He took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. So question, what happens when a king who is owed a huge amount of money cancels somebody's debt? What happens, does the debt just disappear? Is it like, okay, that never happened, that never existed, that's never been, there's really no money involved? At some point, this king gave an amount of money that we can't even calculate and now is saying, like, so he actually, out of his own account, gave it. And now it's not getting paid back, so what does that mean? He took the loss. It's not, it doesn't just disappear. It's not just wiped clean. The forgiver absorbed the debt. That's what forgiveness is. Keep going. But when the servant went out, verse 28, he found one of his fellow servants. So servant, another servant, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. That's a lot of money, but not nearly as much as the other guy, as he owed. He grabbed him and began to choke him. He had just been forgiven this debt that could never be paid back. And now he's choking out a servant because he's not giving him his, his money he owes him. He says, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees, does the same thing, begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. The guy who had been forgiven so much, he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged as they should be and went and told their master everything that had happened. When the master called the servant in, he said, you wicked servant. This is wickedness, right? He says, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? You received mercy, shouldn't you be extending mercy? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your father or sister, look at this, from your heart. From your heart. That's key. You see, the merciful show mercy because they truly understand what it means to receive mercy. 
They truly understand how much their debt was before God and what their true condition was before God without Jesus. Paul says it like this in, in Romans 5.10, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? We were his enemies before Christ. We owed an eternal debt to God because of our sin. God didn't just make it disappear. Debts just don't disappear. They have to be paid either by the one who owes the debt or the one who is owed the debt, right? And the good news of the gospel is this, that Jesus, God in the flesh, absorbed our debt, our sin on the cross so that we could be freed from the eternal consequences of our sin. Listen again, we talked about this last week, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, God, made him, Jesus, who had no sin. Remember, Jesus was sinless, perfect. He had no sin. To be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He became sin for us. He absorbed the sin of the world for us. That's where our debt went. God did not just say it's all gone. It wasn't like poof and it's gone. It had to be paid. Debts have to be paid. So who paid it? Not us, because we couldn't. Who paid it? Christ. How did he pay it? He absorbed it in himself at the cross. So, so what is true forgiveness? Write this down. Forgiveness is absorbing the debt owed you. That's what forgiveness is. When someone wrongs you, it's like they have a debt against you, right? They're racking up debt with you when they sin against you and they wrong you. Forgiveness is absorbing that debt. It doesn't just go away. Someone's got to pay it. But someone who truly understands how much their debt was that they owed God and how much God actually forgave them is someone who in return forgives those who have wronged them because how could they not after all that God has forgiven us of? And that extends even to our enemies. Write down Matthew chapter 5 verses 43 to 48. I think it says Matthew 6 on the screen, but look at Matthew 5. We're not going to turn there. We don't have time, but this is where it, Jesus is saying, even forgive your enemies. Even those that would be considered your enemies, forgive them. And he says, from your heart. So this is the kind of forgiveness that is not some outward verbal thing. It's from the heart. You see, this is where Christian compassion and forgiveness, Christian mercy is very different than what can be expressed by non-Christians. It's coming out of a transformed heart. It's motivated by the grace and mercy of God. So it's not coming out of a desire to look good to others. Often we do compassionate things, we do merciful things because it makes us look good doing charity things because other people think, oh, wow, that's, you're such a nice person. You're such a good person. Or we do those things because we think we're going to earn favor with God and get to heaven someday because I give people money who need it. That's kind of a, non, that's a non-Christian motivation. And it's there all in our culture and society. This is a different kind of motivation. It's coming from a transformed heart. It's motivated by the grace and mercy of God. So it's not coming out of a desire again to look good or just appear to be compassionate. This kind of forgiveness is not only a desire to be free from anger and bitterness. It's motivated by the understanding that my sin against God was far worse than any wrong anyone could ever do to me. And I think this is where we get stuck. We don't view our sin as bad as it really was before God. 
We think we're actually in some way better than other people. And if somebody wrongs me in a, in a way that's very, very hurtful, we, we might kind of justify why we won't forgive them because they're awful, horrible people. And w- the only thing that frees us from that is understanding how terrible our sin actually was before God. And if my sin was that bad and I was forgiven my debt to God, God absorbed my debt in himself at the cross and he exchanged with me his perfection and his eternal forgiveness. Here's the question. How can I not forgive simply out of love and gratitude to God? It's my love for God that actually empowers me to forgive others. So, do you love God? Then it will be seen in how you show mercy, both in compassion and action and how we forgive those who have wronged us. And that leads us to our final point. What's the motivation for all this? And we've been hitting on it. The motivation for mercy, what is it? It's the gospel. It's just simply the gospel. When I say the gospel, I can say love. I can say God's love. I can say God's mercy. I can say God's compassion. The gospel, that's the motivation. And I know, man, when I'm talking about forgiveness, there's a lot of, yeah, but what about, what about, what about? There's a whole lot more that needs to be said about forgiveness, what it is and what it isn't. So I'm gonna, like, in between this series and our next series in the fall, we're gonna start Jonah uh, eventually, but there's a couple weeks in between this series and that. I'm gonna come back to this and talk a little more about forgiveness because I know there's a lot that needs to be said about it. What it is, what it isn't, what it means, implications. We're going to come back to that, okay? We are. But what's the motivation to be able to do it? What's the motivation to be be able to become a merciful person that Jesus says is going to have mercy in the end? It's the gospel. That's the motivation. When the truth of the gospel becomes more than facts in my head, it moves some motivation in my heart. That's when I truly understand and believe the gospel. And let me just read you some passages. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Titus 3, 5, but when the kindness and love of God, our savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, but because of his great love for us, not our great love for him, his great love for us, God, who is rich in what? Mercy, made us Alive. What does that imply? We were dead. He made us alive with Christ even when we were what? Dead in our transgressions, our sins. It's by grace you've been saved. Hebrews 8. For I will forgive their wickedness, and look at this, and remember their sins no more. See, for us, humanly speaking, Forgiving and forgetting is impossible. We can't forget. God can, we can't. But here's the beautiful reality. The more we forgive by God's grace, the less and less and less power and control what somebody did to us has over us. And in a sense, the less that person has control and power over us. And the more we reflect the character and nature of God. And then lastly, Colossians 3, 13, the last part. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. See, here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. He is never going to ask anything of us that he himself has not yet done. He's not asking you to forgive and he's withholding forgiveness, no. He led the way. He stretched out his arms. He was nailed to a cross 
and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that was 2,000 years ago. That was well before anybody sinned against you and hurt you and, 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 and caused any kind of pain in your life. He led the way so that we could learn to forgive others. You see, it's only by God's grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that can make these kinds of people. These kinds of people do not naturally just happen. What naturally happens is John Wick. This is something supernatural. Only God through Christ can do this in the lives of people. So by God's grace, let's pursue Christ-likeness together. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. This, this is hard, God. It goes against our human nature. We want to get revenge. We want to be selfish. But God, that just destroys us and it destroys the world. It's, it's the, why so much of the world is such a mess. We've done this. So God, by your grace in Christ, transform us to better reflect the character and nature of your son. May we more and more be like Jesus for our own good and the good of the world, God. Would you do this in us? I just want to take a second right now before we close out. I don't want to walk away from this without offering us opportunity to let this set in. I don't know in the room who needs to be, uh, who needs to forgive but I'm pretty sure in a room with this many people, there are people who are harboring bitterness and unforgiveness towards people who have hurt you. And I'm gonna ask you to trust Jesus that this is the way. Because the world and the culture is saying unforgiveness is the way. But Jesus, the one who lived for you, died for you, rose for you says, this is the way, forgive, show mercy, Show compassion. And again, we're going to spend more time in the weeks to come talking about what forgiveness is. So hang on for that. But right now, some of us need to just be obedient and ask for God to give you what you cannot do in your own strength. Ask his, for his grace and his power to forgive. Experience the freedom and the joy in obeying Jesus in this way. So right where you are, would you offer that up to God? You know, you have faces and you have names. Some of you have a list and you just need to hand that whole list over to God. And, and just say, God, if you could forgive me, how can I not forgive others? So God, do that work in us today, we pray. Amen.